welcome to Liverpool. Um, I'm really delighted to be uh, chairing this session with Vincent Niana Pragasm. Yeah, they're okay. Uh, and we're doing this on behalf of the section of oncology. Now, at the section of oncology, we've endeavoured to promote best practice through the registries, um, through patient reported outcome, encouraging the use of those, and of course, through bringing the most uh, important and uh, clinically relevant trials to the, to the wider attention. So it's, it's really a great privilege to be chairing a session where we have two uh, extremely important British trials that we're going to hear about. Firstly, uh, Professor Freddie Hamdi, who's chair of the Nuffield uh, Department of Surgical Sciences at Oxford, is going to tell us about PROTECT, and then, of course, uh, Professor Mark Emberton will tell us about PROMISE. So without further ado, I'll give you Freddie. Thank you very much, John. So good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak to you. I, I, I have three pieces of disappointing news for you. The first one is that Iceland beat England yesterday at football. Um, the second one, if you didn't notice, is the UK has voted itself out of the European Union. Um, and the third one is, despite our efforts, the results of the PROTECT study are still under embargo. We have conditional acceptance by a major journal, um, but we're not allowed to present the, the final outcomes until the embargo is lifted. So apologies. I've put together some uh, reflections um, about the PROTECT uh, study and uh, to tell you how the story has been unfolding. So uh, we, we go back to the 1980s um, when PSA was discovered and was started to be used in um, clinical practice. And simultaneously, uh, at the same time, uh, Pat Walsh and uh, an anatomist in, in uh, Belgium, Donker, uh, developed uh, anatomical radical prostatectomy to make it reproducible, safe, with good functional outcomes. And the synergy between these findings uh, and these developments, which were not at all planned together, uh, meant that um, the, there was an emergence of over-detection of prostate cancer, over-treatment, uh, and under-treatment as well, because patients continue to die from the disease. And this was epitomized by the late Jeff Chisholm, who uh, you will remember, he was also president of BAUS um, uh, at some point and died prematurely. Um, and, and what he said is that there is now the prospect of a prostatectomy holocaust unless acceptable data can resolve this debate. And all of this uh, is the result of seemingly simple blood test. Um, and he also said that it must be clear that this debate cannot be resolved because there has never been an appropriate trial either of screening or radical surgery or no immediate treatment. Indeed, until randomized trials are performed, we will not know if early detection with or without radical treatment improves cancer-specific survival. 1993, he died in 1994, but this was extremely inspiring. And this uh, editorial caused complete outrage. I was in, in the US in Bill Catalona's unit for a short while at, at that time, learning how to do open radical prostatectomy. And uh, it caused absolute outrage, but it was so true and Jeff was such a visionary. So the same year, uh, I moved to uh, Newcastle and became David's uh, first senior lecturer uh, when he became chair of surgery. And um, there were all these questions uh, floating around, and um, we were debating how do we answer these big, these big questions, uh, which are, in fact, global, not just proper to the UK. The same year, David introduced me to a, a lady called Jenny Donovan, who was an anthropologist by training, um, was working at the University of Bristol, and Newcastle and Bristol were working together at that time, looking at laser uh, prostatectomy, um, and there was quite a lot of collaboration. So um, Jenny and David and I put together um, uh, over the next two years I'm stuck, can somebody help? Yeah, thank you. So, um, um, uh, I, I went back, sorry. Sorry, could you go back? 
don't seem to be able to control it. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. So, um, in, in between 1994 and 1996, there was a flurry of activity, and we started to put together um, randomized control trial proposals to compare radical prostatectomy with what we called at the time watchful waiting. This was one of the first, and it was rejected, um, and uh, there was another one to the European Commission, which was also rejected. So, between 93 and 1997, um, it was all really pretty uh, uh, um, depressing because we couldn't get any of our ideas funded to do a randomized trial. The opportunities came in 1996 when the HTA, and IHR didn't exist at the time, commissioned two systematic reviews on screening and treatment of prostate cancer, and the outcome and the recommendations were, were that there was insufficient evidence to suggest benefits of screening as a public health policy, and that randomized control trials of screening and treatment were required urgently. So there was a, a call from HTA immediately after that for primary research projects into screening for prostate cancer. And what we did, we did something that we would never get away with now, is uh, we did put uh, two uh, proposals for the protect study design. It wasn't even called protect at the time, but we went against the HTA brief which now would be unheard of and it would be instantly rejected as an outline or a main application. So uh, we put together a feasibility to evaluate whether it was possible to do an RCT of major treatments for localized prostate cancer and we had three questions. The first one was, is community-based PSA testing possible in the UK? Would men accept randomization to a non-intervention arm? And could nurses recruit men as effectively as urologists? And of course, we were scarred by the failed MRC trial, which was not able to recruit uh, men to a um, uh, randomized control trial of surgery versus radiotherapy versus watchful waiting. So everybody was saying, it's not possible, you can't do it. So we will not fund anything unless you show through a pilot that it's possible to do it. And we submitted at the same time the main trial to conduct a major PSA testing program to feed a three-arm randomized trial of treatment effectiveness. Um, and that would be conventional RCT comparing what has moved on from watchful waiting to become active monitoring versus surgery versus radiotherapy with a primary endpoint of disease-specific survival at 10 years. Both grants were submitted in December 1997 and we were successful with the feasibility uh, which was funded, but the main trial was conditional on the feasibility being successful. So we were funded for one year initially to be able to uh, deliver the feasibility and demonstrate that it's possible. And this is one year um, uh, after we started. I had then moved to Sheffield. Um, David was still in Newcastle and Jenny was in Bristol. So we ran the pilot between the three centers and David Gillett, I think I saw him in the audience earlier, uh, was running the Bristol show. Um, and this was the result after one year. And we thought it was the end of it because we had enrolled 22 men. We excluded five. Five were waiting undecided to make up their mind and five had consented to the trial. So we had 42%, which was 8% short of the 50% threshold at which um, the, the feasibility would have been successful. And I, I remember very clearly that before the monitoring visit, which was happening in Bristol with the whole HTA team coming, sitting down around midnight um, in, a, in a, a bed and breakfast in Bristol, looking at the data with Jenny and uh, trying to massage the data. And no matter what you can do to massage, there is a limit when you only have five patients. So we, we said that is the end of the trial and it has been fun. It's a shame it hasn't worked. Much to our surprise, what happened is HTA came and they looked at what we were doing and um, Jenny was doing some really exciting work on uh, recruitment, the psychology of recruitment. Why is it that patients reject randomization? Why is it that uh, recruiters 
uh, some of them are more successful than others. Um, and HTA liked the qualitative research that we were doing. So what we were looking at is scrutiny of the information appointments and extracting the themes which were related to maximizing recruitment. And it was a completely black hole at the moment, at the time. It was a black box, really. So we were exploring lay beliefs about prostate cancer, perceptions of the treatment, understanding the acceptability of randomization. And we started to make some changes in the way that we were putting the information to the patient. So changing the order of the treatments, not starting with surgery or radiotherapy, but starting um, with uh, the non-intervention option, changing the non-intervention op option from watchful waiting to conservative management and eventually to active monitoring. Um, and all this has um, uh, helped us to improve. HTA gave us another year of funding and that was the breakthrough because by the end of the second year, we um, uh, had enrolled 155 men. We had randomized 70% of the men and the average uh, acceptance of allocation of the treatment to one of the three arms was 70%. And that was the breakthrough which allowed us to go on to the main trial. What this has helped to do also is to set the scene for future trials and HTA and other funding bodies for clinical trials now make a point that unless you're able to demonstrate robustly that you're able to undertake the trial, that funding for the main trial is probably not likely to be released. So what have we learned from the pilot study? First of all, qualitative research needs to be embedded into any new trial, and we're running um, uh, others now, like par partial ablation versus radical prostatectomy. We're going exactly through the same exercise of quali qualitative recruitment investigation. Equipoise, it's a term which I was totally unfamiliar with, which is absolutely critical to randomizing patients, even if your body language doesn't match with the words that you're telling the patient, the patient will not randomize. And of course, research nurses have been a huge asset. Um, I would not advise anyone to engage into a major clinical trial without involving research nurses into the randomization and the recruitment process. So the protect study was born uh, in uh, the main trial in 2002. Um, after we completed the pilot feasibility, nine centers of the UK and a very large team uh, with something around 90 people employed full time through uh, the trial itself. And um, the pioneers of that study will remember when we met the very first time in a small room in the Royal College of Surgeons in the year 2001 with a lot of skepticism about whether we would be able to do this or not. So I'm really grateful for all the team that has agreed to come together and to pull this through. Um, it, it, it's been a tour de force and we have succeeded. Um, we have uh, published our baseline data in Lancet Oncology two years ago now, uh, summarizing all our recruitment finding, and that by the end of December 2008, when recruitment closed, is where we are. We had invited over 200,000 men and 111,000 responded, um, of whom we tested 82,000. Uh, we found 2,664 eligible cases who had a PSA of three or more and who received systematic 10 core biopsies or more. Out of those, 63% were randomized to either active monitoring, surgery, or radiotherapy, and uh, the rest chose their own treatment and declined randomization. This makes PROTEC the largest RCT of treatment effectiveness in the world. These were the randomized characteristics, and you can see that between the three arms, they're pretty much um, equal. Um, what we noticed is that at biopsy, um, we had about three quarters of men with low risk disease. When we published later, a, uh, uh, Jim uh, Cato uh, published the um, results of um, the radical prostatectomy patients alone, we found that in fact, the rate of low risk disease was lower than 75%. Uh, it was around 40% according to the conventional criteria. 
Um, in terms of uh, the randomized and non-randomized uh, arm, so the patients who declined randomization and chose their own treatment, there was very little difference in their characteristics. So eventually, whilst we now have analyzed initially the intention to treat analysis in the randomized cohort, the preference cohort is going to be extremely informative, as well as the cohort of men uh, who received the treatments as opposed to were randomized to the treatment. So all this is going to come um, in, in the next uh, uh, months and years. Uh, when you compare with the main trials, I think um, we certainly have the most contemporary cohort, we have the largest cohort, we have 100% PSA detection. Um, the weaknesses are we don't have Afro-Caribbeans, uh, and that reflects the composition of the cohorts within the cities where um, uh, protect took place, and we have a lower median PSA compared to uh, PIVOT and um, um, SBCG4. In terms of patient reported outcomes, we religiously uh, collected and over collected patient reported outcomes with the uh, validated instruments and questionnaires, and uh, we will be reporting six years of full follow up for all these patients. Um, in the publication which will uh, come out uh, in the next, uh, uh, in the near future, uh, hopefully. This is just to show you the protect timeline um, when we started, um, I don't think, yeah, when we started uh, back in 1999 with all the various extensions and various components. And this has been the funding phases. We're, we're really, really so grateful to HDN and IHR for believing in the study, for making it a flagship of clinical trials in the UK, that it is now called uh, NIHR's most expensive trial, um, and it is true. Um, we have funding until the end of 2017 for follow-up, and we hope that the impact of our publication will allow us to get additional funding to be able to go to a full 15-year uh, follow-up uh, after that. Now, when we designed uh, PROTECT, um, we were randomizing uh, pre, we were doing a pre-consent randomization of all the general practices in the nine centers, which meant that there was a natural comparison arm um, to protect with no screening. And as you know, opportunistic testing in the UK is low, it's around 11%. It is going up, but very slowly, but not compared to the US or Western Europe. And uh, the Department of Health and Cancer Research UK then um, uh, funded us to be able to test screening as well as treatment. And uh, by doing that, it's converted PROTECT into the intervention arm of the largest uh, randomized control trial of screening um, globally. So what are, are the advantages of being able to study screening? Well, first of all, it's a cluster design. Um, uh, secondly, and then there's very low contamination. Initially, it was 6%, now it's about 11%. Um, there is an intervention arm, which is PROTECT, and the effective sample size is larger than ERSPC and PLCO put together. So we're talking about 424,000, almost half a million men who have been randomized to screening and not screening, and within the screen arm there is the intervention arm of PROTECT. Now what happened in the meantime in these 15 years, and it's worth reflecting on that, well, SPCG4 continued to report uh, widening uh, curves, Kaplan-Meier curves, in terms of disease-specific uh, mortality, um, uh, all-cause mortality, and development of metastasis and progression in favor of intervention with radical prostatectomy versus watchful waiting. And uh, there are now 23-year results, and the other thing which is emerging is a kind of um, uh, age threshold of 65 years above which there seems to be reduced benefit of radical treatment. And that will be interesting when we compare that with PROTECT data. Um, the PIVOT trial you're all uh, familiar with showed no differences, but we have to remember the limitations. There was very low uh, randomization acceptance, it was around 12%, uh, uh, um, and um, the differences they showed were in favor of intervention, possibly in the intermediate uh, uh, grades. 
Then there is uh, trials of screening and the 13-year follow-up from the ERSPC shows a, a curve which now tells us that the number needed to screen is around 781 and the number needed to treat is around 27 in order to save one man from dying of prostate cancer. So what went wrong with the evidence which made the US task force recommend uh, not to go for screening and all the uncertainty which continues with treatment? Um, well, first of all, there was insufficient large-scale randomized RCTs, and PROTEC is going to help. Radiotherapy was never evaluated before in that context. Focal therapy was only in phase 3 RCT, and Mark will forgive me for saying, but I do believe it was done in the wrong cohort in low-risk patients. Uh, screening trials did not evaluate treatment effectiveness, and there's been profound genomic diversity and our inability to stratify patients ac accurately. The trade-off between the oncological benefit and patient-reported outcomes has not been uh, uh, reported before. There are a few health warnings. and um, The first one is, what is really the definition of low-risk prostate cancer? Surely it's low risk of local progression, low risk of metastasis, low risk of death, i.e. non-lethal disease. But by how much, at what cost, and can we maintain a patient who has the diagnosis of prostate cancer into a window of curability so that we do not miss the opportunity to cure him if he needs to be cured? And that um, really goes back to the old uh, um, quote from uh, Willett Whitmore. And the genomic diversity is an emerging problem which is actually quite significant and it is our Achilles heel. I'll take you back to a paper that was published now three years ago or longer uh, from Hopkins where they took a man age 47 with a low risk prostate cancer or possibly even very low risk prostate cancer by today's definitions. And they traced that man, he later developed progressing disease and he developed metastasis and he died of metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. And they sequenced and looked at the genetic composition of individual tumors as the tumors evolved because they had the samples. And what they found was staggering in that the clonality of the killer cancer was similar to the clonality of the most benign part of the prostate when the cancer was diagnosed. So when we say that Gleason 6 prostate cancer is not cancer, when we say that all Gleason 6 cancers can be safely treated with active surveillance or active monitoring, there is a fundamental problem in the genomic diversity of the disease which doesn't quite allow us to say this with the certainty and the reliability that we need for these patients. David Neal um, with uh, his team, a very large uh, national and international team, uh, published last year by looking simply at three patients, the genomic diversity, intraprostatic genomic diversity of, um, uh, uh, of these patients, looking at individual, really diving deeply into individual areas of tumor within the prostates themselves. And to cut a long story short, what what was uh, found was that mutations at high levels in tissue which looked benign morphologically, so the b benign phenotype, had mutations which were shared by the cancer itself. And that really is a, a very, very important finding which we need to elucidate further by trying to understand what is really the makeup of lethal but also what is the makeup of non-lethal disease, and that is uh, a really big challenge. So what is the impact of uh, PROTEC to date? Um, well, uh, so we've, we've published the outcomes and experience of single PSA screening, uh, of prostate biopsies, uh, we've impacted on NICE guidelines, uh, the pathology national urology EQA has been uh, driven a lot by why, what was happening in PROTECT, uh, radiotherapy QA, we've designed a lot of novel trial methodology. Um, we, we have been looking at the suitability of patients for focal therapy. Um, we've got a very rich biobank for translational research. Um, we've impacted on career development for many juniors and many nursing staff. Uh, we've contributed to the UK parliamentary inquiry in 2014, and there is no doubt that trial participation has changed clinicians' attitudes towards patient counselling. What will it add to what ERSPC and PLCO have provided already? 
so we've published the patient demographics, we are publishing the outcomes of treatment and active monitoring. Um, we are looking at disease-specific mortality, and that's being reported this year. All-cause mortality, the effects of a single PSA testing, and uh, we are carrying on with our translational research. Um, huge team to which I'm greatly indebted. You can see uh, my partners in crime in the front row there. Um, and uh, this is the last patient to be randomized. So we are grateful to 111,000 participants. Um, uh, this is the trial steering committee uh, who have helped and guided us over the last 15 years. We met annually once and we continue to work with them. These are some historical dates. July 2015, we finalized our statistical analysis plan. This is taken at the Academy uh, in London. Uh, 23rd November, uh, we're pressing the button to uh, get the first graph. And the first time I saw the first graph, my heart sank. But uh, I, I quickly, uh, um, within the next few weeks, we, we were diving into the data and we started to uh, smile um, again. So, um, uh, we are reporting in uh, uh, important publications coming up, 10-year median follow-up, uh, clinical outcomes, mortality, disease-specific and all cause, disease progression and metastasis, patient-reported outcomes, and outcomes of excluded men with advanced disease but diagnosed through the PROTEX study. So Churchill is, uh, um, I'm sure, uh, a hero for many of us, but I really do like this, which says that success is not final, failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts, and I want to thank everybody that's been involved in making this such a success. And uh, this is the sun setting um, in Oxford. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Freddie. Uh, whilst people are making their way to the microphones, we have time for a couple of questions. I think it was always a bit of a gamble uh, that the data might be embargoed by this, at this date. Um, but can I ask a question? Given the natural history of prostate cancer being very long, given the fact that when Protex started in the UK, a high volume surgeon would probably have done 30 or 40 cases, and the dose regime for external beam radiotherapy varied widely. Are you going to be able to, yeah. have you been able to deal with those confinders? So, so we, we future-proofed for that, fortunately, at the time. As far as surgeon experience was concerned, we conducted, an, uh, before any surgeon was allowed to operate on protect patients, we conducted an audit of uh, their last uh, 30 consecutive radical prostatectomy, and we used the uh, international criteria that um, Hein van Poppel had published in 2000 in the European Journal of Cancer where he did a survey across Europe. And we all fit in the correct quartile when we come to report. And the outcome of our uh, surgery will, will prove that. Uh, as far as radiotherapy is concerned, uh, we also uh, were future-proofed for that by using neoadjuvant androgen deprivation therapy and 74 gray uh, um, conformal 3D. Uh, radiotherapy. So we are at par with IMRT, for example. Good. Okay. Here's a question, microphone yeah. three. So successes continue, funding continue. The protect, how much longer we protect our result? I think I asked the same question December last year when we, you presented on the yes. academic section of the urology. So I would like to see what's the final outcome. So I, we, we, don't, we don't have a, a, a publication date. We are sending uh, revised uh, versions to the journal. And uh, I am optimistic that we will have um, uh, something which is public with uh, a, a, the, the embargo lifted. Um, uh, certainly this, this, this year, um, and I'm hoping it will be weeks rather than months. And um, so I'm completely optimistic about it. So is there any way we know the final results rather than waiting not for today, the sadly, to come out? Sadly, not today. But as soon, there will be quite a lot of press releases and publicity around the time of the publication. 
Um, as has happened with previous similar studies, you will remember what happened with ERSPC and what happened with SPCG4. There was quite a lot of uh, publicity, and I'm sure that BAUS will want to be at the forefront of that publicity um, when, when it comes out. So we will stay very closely um, uh, in, in touch with the officers uh, at BAUS and, and the, the President, Mark, and, and others. I'm, I'm we'll be very interested to the I'm project sorry, now I'm, is followed I'm, I'm by the I'm conscious of the time. Result. I think we'll have Thank to go to, can we go to another question, please, to microphone two, and that'll be the last question. I'm sorry, Tim, because we need to move on. Freddie, Freddie thanks, uh, uh, Alan. Freddie, you um, mentioned something about the, the rate of Gleason 6s being high initially and then, and then yes. apparently dropping. Is that something to do with the pathologist's reclassification no, of no. Gleason grading? No, because we, we published a paper looking at uh, Gleason shift over the course of Prote, and there was very little shift in the grading. Now, of course, this doesn't take into consideration the very recent regrading, so, so it doesn't. Uh, and I think what it reflects is sample variability, probably, uh, with biopsies, as opposed to, we're going to hear, targeted biopsies which pick up the high-grade disease. I think that's the reflection of that limitation. So, Freddie, thank you very much for your presentation. Perhaps you'll come back to the section meeting in the autumn when we'll all have had a chance to pour over the publication and have lots more questions. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now we move to uh, another study which uh, really the UK has led. And I think where we can see the UK leads is in practical questions to innovations, firstly from PSA and Protect, and now to the very new uh, and very exciting world of MRI and biopsy, and it's fair to say that Mark Emberton and UCL have been leaders in this area in th getting us to think about how we do biopsies, and Mark's refrain of putting a needle to the rectum being dipping it in feces always will spring to mind. But finally, we're going to hear uh, the results of the PROMISE trial. Um, which uh, promises to be very exciting for us in terms of how we change our practice. Um, Mark. So, Vincent, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege and, and pleasure to be able to present some preliminary data for you here at BAUS. Uh, the slides I'm going to show were presented at ASCO. Um, there is the paper, the manuscript is under review at present, so I can't go beyond what's here, but there's plenty to chew over. Uh, the, the PROMISE study was a collaboration between um, NIHR, the HTA, so the same funders as PROTECT, and also the MRC Clinical Trials Unit. But before proceeding, uh, I think we just want to make a, a few acknowledgements. This too was a huge effort and a great credit to um, uh, British science and, and British funding. Um, the pathologists and the radiologists, the two Alexes, Alex Freedom and Alex Kirkham, uh, really need to be mentioned. Uh, Sharta, the research fellow who developed repetitive strain injury from doing so many biopsies, also needs to be mentioned. He's now uh, going on to radiological training. Uh, but the real importance of this study were the collaborating centers. Uh, the main criticism of MRI studies, and there have been plenty, is that they've been done in expert centers. This is the first study that wasn't. Uh, and, and we have a, a range of centers that were um, at various stages of adoption of MRI, and they are represented here. And we're very grateful to the teams at Basingstoke, Southampton, Southmead, Charing Cross, Wrexham, uh, Sheffield, uh, Taunton, Frimley Park, the Whittington Hospital in London, and Maidstone. And this, was, this makes the study different to all studies that have gone before. The other group of people that really need um, mentioning and we need to thank as a group are, are the patients. Uh, there were extraordinary levels of altruism shown in this study. Uh, many of the patients that took part in the study could have uh, gone around the study and obtained an MRI, um, and many of them actually wanted to, but um, many were uh, actually very happy to take part in the study, and some of them unnecessarily, as I'll, as I'll demonstrate, underwent not only uh, truss biopsies, but five millimeter template sampling, uh, sometimes in a very large prostate. A lot of the men suffered harm as a result, but they were very pleased to take part. Uh, even the men that tested negative were very grateful to have been given the opportunity to contribute to the science. So strongly they felt about uh, uh, being um, agents to incorporate MRI into the clinical pathway. It was very humbling uh, to see this. So just to go back, it's almost 10 years now um, exactly uh, since this very first paper was studied, was, was published. Uh, this is Arno Villiers' study from Lille, um, and he had 24 patients in this study. 
Uh, he cut up the prostate to, to generate about 100 um, paired analyses. Uh, but this was the first study that really gave us some inclination that MRI could contribute to um, accurately diagnosing, so ruling in, um, but also ruling out clinically significant disease, in this case defined by two levels of prostate cancer volume, 0.2 and 0.5 cc. So just remember those figures, the sensitivity of between 80 and 90 percent and a negative predictive value of between 85 and 95 percent. So 10 years on now, and in a sense, Promise was designed to verify these data that several um, expert groups were coming up in very small um, and highly selected groups. And the principal objective uh, was to see if we could identify groups of men that could safely avoid an unnecessary biopsy due to a negative test result in the way that a negative mammogram will allow you to reassure a woman that she doesn't need a biopsy. We were also interested in um, seeing if we could address the overdiagnosis issue. Obviously, if you biopsy fewer men, you address that specifically. And we were also interested whether MRI could assist us in correctly identifying men with clinically significant prostate cancer. So in other words, if you were presented with a normal MRI such as this, uh, what confidence could we have in reassuring the man that he was indeed free of clinically significant disease? And this is um, about as normal as you get on, a, on an MRI. So in terms of trial design, for diagnostic studies, there are three things that uh, need to be fulfilled to get to kind of level one evidence. First is that um, all the men need to have all the tests. Uh, the second is all the tests need to be independent of each other to avoid workup and incorporation bias. And the third is to exclude a man who can't complete one of the tests. So you take that man out of the study and replace him with another man that might. So you need all the tests done in all the men and all the ten tests done independently. So this was not, as Freddie suggested, a trial about targeting. There was no targeting in this because everybody was blind to all the tests. It was impossible to direct your needles anywhere. The trial involved men having um, an MRI, and then a truss biopsy and a five millimeter template biopsy. And it's important to consider each component of that. So the truss biopsy was done in the usual way. The only real difference you need to know about is that the man was asleep because it was done at the same time as the template biopsy. He was turned onto the left lateral side and the needles were very widely distributed around the prostate. The other thing you need to know is that the truss biopsy was done after the template biopsy. Uh, which will obviously have an effect on the template biopsy, but we didn't feel it was safe to do the truss biopsy first, followed by a, a very intensive um, uh, five millimeter template sampling. We thought the risk, and indeed the ethics committees thought the risk of sepsis was too great. So truss biopsy followed the reference test, which was the five millimeter sampling. The index test, the test that we were testing, uh, was an MRI at 1.5 Tesla. Again, deliberate. Uh, these were the machines that were around at the time. Uh, and, uh, and if anything, the results will be a conservative estimate of what MRI is capable of doing, given that many of us have transitioned to uh, modern three Tesla machines. So that's, that's, that's the first important point. The other one is that our radiologists were asked to score the MRI, um, not with pyrads, because pyrads didn't exist then, but with a similar ordinal scale of one to five, in which one um, the patient was deemed to be very unlikely to have clinically significant prostate cancer and five very likely to have clinically significant prostate cancer. And the other bit that's important, and each MRI study is different here, is that we declared a positive MRI as an MRI that was scored by radiologists as, as being a Likert score of three, four, and five. Some American studies have included three, sorry, twos um, uh, and above, uh, we've published studies that have only incorporated fours, fours and fives, and they identify different cohorts of men from the background population. This is the template biopsy. It was done according to the Barzell uh, standards. Many of you are doing it in this manner. And basically, you, you biopsy the prostate apex and base um, in, in, in the Z coordinate until you ran out of prostate, as you can see here. Uh, so it's a very exacting probably the best reference standard that we could apply for these patients. And what that allows us to do is if the uh, template biopsy was negative, we can have very, very high confidence, about 95% confidence, uh, that the patient 
isn't harboring a lesion of 0.2 cc's or greater. And we can do that with extraordinary precision. But obviously it doesn't rule out all prostate cancers, nor does it hit the prostate cancer head on as it would do in a targeted sampling when you're throwing multiple cores at it. These, again, important uh, when we consider the outcome. So the clinically meaningful, end, meaningful endpoint that we chose uh, was this. Uh, so this was the clinically significant disease that we were trying to rule in and rule out. Um, there is no um, universally agreed definition of clinical significance. Uh, this has the merits of uh, being one that everybody agrees that you would want to find it if this was there. Um, it also has the merits that it has been stable over time, so dominant pattern for disease hasn't changed. In fact, Freddie's paper that alluded to shows this, whereas um, secondary pattern for has, both in terms of the rules that, um, uh, that we use to apply secondary pattern for and also the propensity for applying it uh, um, related to the amount of tissue that you present to the pathologist. Um, obviously, all the secondary analysis will explore your favorite definition of clinical significance, uh, but that obviously is to come. This was the primary. Um, all tests were blinded to each other, so they're all done independently. And this is the schema of the study. Uh, there were very few withdrawals apart from at the time of the template biopsy, which you can see there. And that was really um, either due to access to the prostate in other words, pubic arch interference, which didn't allow you to complete the test, or that the prostate was so big, 200 cc's, that it was futile even to attempt it. And so here, men with large prostates, and by definition low PSA densities, because the PSA uh, was, had an upper limit of 15, were systematically excluded from this study, which means that the prevalence of true negatives is diminished in the study due to these exclusions. The results... So let's look at truss first. Um, truss biopsy had a sensitivity for clinically significant disease given the definition. So dominant pattern four or a lesion that was six millimeters or more using the UK definition of cancer core length. So the sensitivity of truss biopsy was 48%. So truss biopsy missed half of um, the clinically significant disease that was present. The negative predictive value of truss biopsy was uh, around 75%, 74%. So in other words, one in four patients that you tell you are all clear, sir, is actually harboring clinically significant disease. The diagnostic accuracy for MRI, the sensitivity was 93%. So twice as good as truss biopsy at identifying clinically significant disease if clinically significant disease was present and negative predictive values in the order of 90%. Remember, the prevalence of true negatives in this was quite low because of the exclusions. This is, if, this is uh, the slide that shows MRI as a biomarker. So you can see the Likert score attribution, uh, one to five along the bottom. If you were given a score of five, you had about a 98% chance of having prostate cancer and about an 80% chance of having clinically significant cancer. And you can also see the effects of where you draw the boundary of MRI positivity. If you had an older man in front of you, and obviously the decision models that we'll create will allow you to make this judgment, you might only choose to biopsy fours and fives. If you have a younger man and you were particularly interested in ruling out clinically significant disease, you might choose to biopsy twos and threes as they do in the United States. So this is, again, just comparing the two tests formally. 48% um, versus 93%, so 100% difference in accuracy, in, in sensitivity. Uh, we often adopt tests that are 10% better than the old test. This is 100% better at identifying disease that we want to find, and a negative predictive value of 90% versus 74%. So what about the misses? Um, in yesterday's session, there was a lot of concern about the types of cancer that were missed, uh, by MRI, and they're clearly important, and it's these that we're interested in. Uh, first of all, there weren't many, uh, but obviously they're very important, and we need to understand why they were missed. Uh, this gave us the opportunity to compare misses from truss biopsy and also MRI misses, um, and we can see here the long cancer core lengths. So in other words, these are cancers that qualified as six millimeters or more that were Gleason 3 plus 3, 
There were seven misses in the truss biopsy and one miss in the MRI. For Gleason 3 plus 4, there were 99 misses in the truss biopsy and 16 uh, by the MRI. And interestingly, um, MRI didn't miss any dominant pattern 4. No Gleason 8, 9, or 10s were missed by MRI. Um, given uh, our, our reference standard you know, when, when subjected to 5 millimeter sampling, but 13 were missed by the truss biopsy. So I think we can make some conclusions. The high sensitivity and negative predictive value um, uh, allow us to, at, at 1.5 Tesla, to justify a triage test that can identify those men that might avoid a primary biopsy. The relatively low specificity and positive predictive value of prostate MRI, particularly around MRI scores of three or four, mean that a biopsy, and in the future I think, I agree with Freddie, this would be a targeted biopsy, uh, will still be required to get you off the fence. If we do a little bit of modeling, and this is the only modeling that was um, presented, there will be much more sophisticated modeling uh, presented in, in, the, in the various manuscripts, uh, we can start to see how MRI might play out in the future. So if you start with the full cohort in the trust biopsy and MRI groups, so 100% of the men that were recruited and eligible for all the tests. Um, if you um, offer not to biopsy the men with normal MRIs in the MRI group, you get down to fewer men biopsied overall. Uh, this results in fewer men being diagnosed with clinically insignificant disease. And although fewer men are biopsied, the MRI detection method uh, allows more men with clinically significant disease to be identified. Um, so in other words, 40% versus 20%. So you, know that you double the number of patients that are correctly attributed their, their diagnosis. So I think we can make some preliminary conclusions from these data. Um, trust biopsy performed very poorly. Um, trust biopsy has seldom been compared to an appropriate reference standard. It's compared against radical prostatectomy, but obviously all the men have cancer originally, um, and it's compared against itself, which is, uh, again, not a great test, but this, this shows us the degree to which it misses the significant disease that we're trying to identify. MRI prior to trust, bi trust biopsy can identify at least a quarter of men that could be safely reassured that they don't need a, a biopsy. MRI followed by biopsy can reduce overdiagnosis to some degree, and MRI can identify over 90% of the men who have clinically significant prostate cancer. There are some residual uncertainties, and I'm sure they'll come up in discussion shortly. Uh, issues of cost effectiveness are going to be addressed, so Mark Sculfer at York University is doing that as we speak. And uh, tomorrow morning, uh, issues of quality control uh, will be addressed at the session sponsored by uh, Prostate Cancer UK, and I've got a little reminder of that at the end of the um, talk. But there are some other issues that need addressing, um, uh, and they relate to the real-life implications of offering men an MRI-guided pathway, the role and utility of targeting. Uh, Promise did not target. The verification was blind to the location of the tumor, and also the role of random biopsies. And I'm very pleased to say that the trial exists to resolve these res residual uncertainties, and many of you are taking part in it. And this is a trial where men who are referred for biopsy are offered an MRI. If there's a lesion, you biopsy it. If there's no lesion, you don't. So we take the evidence from promise and actually apply it to management. And the comparator is a standard trust-guided biopsy. And the outcome here is any Gleason pattern for in the biopsies that are obtained. So you'll have fewer men biopsies, and we'll be looking at the proportion of pattern fours that are generated from both strategies. Uh, this is recruiting ahead of schedule. Um, it is perhaps the most poorly funded study in the history of studies, um, but, it's, but it's working because people want it to work. Um, and these are currently uh, the, the centers that are, that are taking part in Precision, and many of you in the audience, and you can join um, Mayo Clinic and others in America and throughout the world that are taking part. And if you wish to take part, uh, you can um, contact Burst or Viru uh, Kazi uh, here. You can see his, his um, email there. Uh, and he will do everything he can to um, get your center up and running. Uh, and I think this is the complementary study that we need to um, 
promise. Um, there is a masterclass for urologists scheduled in September. If you feel you've been left behind with MRI and want to become expert in interpreting MRI, we're going to see many of these. This is one we're running, and we've managed to get the cost down to uh, 50 pounds for you, uh, and that's booking up quite rapidly at present. So if you want to take part, again, please contact us, and, and Veru um, there uh, will take your um, name and uh, allocate you a place. And importantly, tomorrow uh, morning, um, the evidence is one thing, but actually disseminating it and getting it into practice is another. And Prostate Cancer UK have taken this extremely seriously um, and are going to work with BAUS and with yourselves to um, assist you in getting um, high quality MRI up and running for your patients. And there is precedent for this. Um, when mesorectal excision of the rectum was shown to be um, of benefit to patients compared to standard care. It did involve MRI and MRI planning of the rectal excision. Those skills were not widely disseminated um, and, a and a charity called Pelican went round and ran MDTs and training courses to help units do that. And I think that's the intention of Prostate Cancer UK uh, for which we're very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. And um, it just sort of highlights that sometimes if you go back and ask a very simple question, you realize no one asked that before. And really, it was, was trust biopsy as good as it could be. Um, obviously, we're going to be open to questions from the floor, so please do queue up behind the numbers as you can see them. But maybe I can start by, by saying, Mark, uh, by asking, Mark, that um, your definition of clinically significant cancer is probably the one thing which you've had lots and lots of questions about, I'm yeah. sure. Um, and even by your own definitions, um, MPMRI missed 10% of them. Do you really think that that's enough to justify saying that MPMRI can exclude patients from having a biopsy? Well, I think if you're going to biopsy, it's not the trust that you should do. So it'll, it'll, have, it'll have to be a 5 millimeter template biopsy. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. And that's a kind of discussion that you need to have with the patient. But we've now got a test that is non-invasive and 90% as good as a five millimeter template sampling. Um, and, and I think that will be an interesting discussion to have with patients. And most people will go for the MRI in, in my experience, but obviously we need to find that out. But you know, if, if you really want to find, and remember five millimeter template biopsy doesn't find everything, um, but it's the best test in this um, trio of tests. And if you want that, you can apply it. What we've now got is a test that gets very, very close to it. Um, that I think will be very useful in the majority of men to help them make a decision on biopsy. And I completely agree that I think the case for doing an MRI before biopsy is well made. Um, it's a question about not biopsying, which is the crucial one. Number two. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mark, there's, there's no doubt that your study and, and a few others have demonstrated we must do MRIs before we do biopsies. Um, but I, I'm still concerned about the, where you get the 25% can be safely reassured without a biopsy from the data that you've presented. Which 25% so, are you not biopsied? So these are the true negatives. So, so these, these are MRIs that are negative, that are not associated with any clinically significant disease on 5 millimeter template sampling. Um, and you know, we now, we've now got a test that can reasonably identify those individuals. I think, I think the, the new bit of information is that trust biopsy is unreliable in doing that. And we've historically used the negative predictive value of trust biopsy to reassure men. We now know that that reassurance is misguided and that men with a negative trust biopsy need to be carefully monitored or perhaps subjected to a, a better test. So, sorry, can I just ask again, um, but the, if the negative predictive value using your definition um, of clinically significant disease is still up to 89%. Where, where, do you get, where do you get that you can reassure 25% of people from? So th these would be the men who are not offered a biopsy. Yes, so, so in other words, the, the men who test negative, so it's a subset of all the men uh, who then on five millimeter template sampling did not have clinically significant disease. Number one. Um, Mark, yeah, was a brilliant presentation, thank you. I was going to ask a question about the blinding of ultrasound in the study, because the sensitivity of trust in this study is a bit lower than it is 
when you do truss biopsies that are where well, you're using MRI and you're using ultrasound. So one thing I, I would observe is that if you do a template biopsy with transrectal ultrasound, you will be using that ultrasound to guide your needle slightly. Whereas if you have to do a truss biopsy after it's been pepper potted first, that, that ultrasound's probably not very useful, is it? I, I think that's fair. Um, and uh, in fact, it's been, we've had criticisms from uh, American neurologists. So, so the, the standard of care is, is as I've described it. It is a 12-core biopsy directed to the corners of the prostate. There is no attempt within that intervention to target any echo-pore areas or to do any anterior shots. It, it, it is what it is. And we'll never know, but you'll have to make a judgment. Each one of us will have to make a judgment on the degree to which truss biopsy was compromised um, by being subjected to the second test you'll certainly have gland swelling, and so the target will be of greater volume when you're subjected to truss biopsy, uh, and therefore the opportunity to identify a lesion if it's present will be diminished. We, we, we can't work out the degree to which that error, the, 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 quantum, the quantum of that error, but certainly it's there. I think it would have been impossible to do the opposite, and we did consider randomizing the allocation, but the ethics committees, I think, correctly didn't let us do that. So we're going to randomize priority um, in the men in the study. And in the end, for safety reasons, we went for the sterile procedure first, followed by the non-sterile procedure second. And was it reco recorded at that ultrasound whether or not the lesions were visible under ultrasound for no. the study or not? No. Okay. Thank you. Number two. Uh, Mark, brilliant, as always. Um, I know nothing about MRI, but does the study now have to be repeated with a three Tesla MRI and then a five and a seven, and each time MRI gets changes, do you have to... In a, do you have to re do the study again, or can you just extrapolate to the new technology? So I think this was deliberate, in, in, in a way, um, to, to use existing um, kind of low-magnet strength technology on the assumption that the differences or the, the effects that we've shown would be a very conservative estimate of what was possible. And I think it's not unreasonable to assume that if you use a magnet of twice the strength that is uh, five years um, more modern in its construction, that these performance characteristics will be improved. So, so this is the results on a, you know, on a, on a standard 1.5 Tesla that exists in every DGH in the country, that is currently doing hips and knees. And it's our, I think, challenge to force those knees out and to get our prostates in. Number two. Mark, uh, well awaited study, well presented. So, the, I mean, there's a lot of concern whether MRI really picks up. And if you look at the paper later on, we are presenting just under 700 cases of radical prostatectomy compared to the MRI, which is all 1.5 different MRIs within our network. Our positive predictive value is exactly the same as what you got, which is around 51%. I think yours is 48. And our negative predictive value, which is what is more important, was 91%. You got 89 on your template biopsy. It, the figures match very well. It just means MRI actually overcalls the result most of the time. We can be rest assured it actually overcalls because the positive predictive value is just 48 and yours and 51 and ours. So even uh, if you say 25% of biopsies are going, you can safely assure these people I think you'll be correct. I mean, the false positives, uh, I, I don't have an issue with because we're, we're going to either watch them or biopsy them. Um, so, and th this, this performs much better than um, mammography, for instance. Um, and remember, there was a huge Hawthorne effect here. The, the radiologists were under huge scrutiny because they were being judged and their performance was being judged. So they were calling stuff that they probably wouldn't call in, um, in routine practice. Um, and, and indeed, so, so I, think, I, I think that positive predictive value is what it is. Um, and then as clinicians, we have to decide whether to verify it with a needle. Once you get to four or fives, it's almost certain that there's clinically significant prostate cancer there. Uh, I think the issue, and it always has been with MRI, is what you do with the gray zone. So in other words, the men with threes, whether you watch them or whether you biopsy them. Does that address... It does, because um, if you look at our thing, our low-risk patients are only 17 of the 700. Majority were high-risk, and the predictive value of the MRI was exactly the same as what you're calling as clinically significant. 
Thank you. One final question then, Mike Two. Yeah, uh, congratulations, Mark. Uh, great study. But you, you probably know on the Trends blog that uh, Simon and Ben Chalicum did, the, the, one of the concerns is your definition of clinically significant yeah. disease, four plus three and six millimeters or more uh, core length. Can you just defend that for us? Because well, I've, I've tried to do that twice. Or, well, so, so I think um, you can only have one definition, first of all. Um, this is a definition that has been validated, it's been modeled, it's been used by several um, individuals and has the merit of incorporating both grade and volume. And I think what's going to happen uh, is, is that the importance of volume is going to become more evident as we, as we are better at classifying it. The other thing about the clinically meaningful endpoint, it's got to be something that the reference test can reliably pick up. There's no point in having something that your reference test is no good at finding. Um, and therefore, the volume aspect, I think, is important, given that we're subjecting the prostate to five millimeter sampling. And I'll say it again, the, um, the beauty about dominant pattern four is that it's been stable. Definitions haven't changed during the period before during the study and since the study, whereas secondary pattern four has been all over the place. And I think Freddie's paper shows that the likelihood of being diagnosed with secondary pattern four has gone up over 10 years by about 40% or something like that. So it would be impossible or indeed very ill-advised to choose a definition that was labile or, or at least unstable temporally because you wouldn't know where you are. Well, now, thank you. Um, I think we're going to have to close the can session. Can I just say here. one thing? That they, they, uh, just in, in reply to that, see, most of us clinicians would say that a patient with 3 plus 4, 5.9 millimeter uh, core length would, would have clinically significant yeah. disease. I mean, you have to have a cut point, I know, but. Uh, I so so, so you'll, you'll have to wait till the secondary analyses. So we'll analyze it in, in, in lots of different ways. Secondary pattern four. Um, on a 0.2 cc lesion, which is four millimeters, we'll also do an analysis by um, any pattern four, which is the outcome which uh, you've seen in precision. So that, that will be available. Not in the, I don't think it'll be in the first paper, that'll be in a subsequent paper. Thank you, Mark. Our, our president awaits. Um, I think the two uh, presentations this morning have been a great advert for UK urology and what it can achieve. I sincerely hope in the light of the events of this week we're still talking about UK urology in five years. I live and work in Scotland. Um, but anyway, I, I would like to thank Freddie and Mark for their presentations and for your participation. But that's the end of the session. <laughs>